thank you for being here this evening and sharing your time. This is a good-looking Monday night crowd. I'm always happy to get past Sunday as an evangelist because the rest of the week is the want-to. Want-to crowd, amen? I realize somebody, some people work, but you're the want-to crowd. You are the hungry crowd. So guess what? They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. That is not a double phrasing of the same theme. Your spirit is what hungers. Your mind is what thirsts. So you're going to not only be fed spiritually, but emotionally. Amen. And so thank you for your giving and the offering. This ministry lives by seeds of faith that we plant. Not that you plant, but that we plant. We are a product of our sowing. Amen. God is our source. And I thank God I learned that a long, long time ago in the ministry. I am an unmuzzled ox. I can tell you the truth whether you give or not. So you don't give to this ministry because I'm going to lose my house. You give to this ministry because you believe in this ministry. Amen. And if you're going to make any investments, you don't put it in a company that's going under. We have covenant partners, and I had a dear lady tell me, she said, Brother Mark, it looks like God's really blessed you, so we're going to stop supporting you every month and start supporting a another ministry that's really struggling. And I said, that's fine, whatever you think. Poor soul, you don't throw seeds in dirt just because you feel sorry. There's nothing growing. <laughs> Hello? Hello? You are a product of what you plant into. I had a preacher tell me, he said, Mark, God convicted me. He said, for 10 years I've been telling people what a powerful revelation God has given you in the Word. And God told me, shut up or put up. I said, what are you talking about? He handed me a check, which was a large amount to him. He said, God told me to put my money where my mouth is. He said, if I believe in it, support it and spread it. Amen. Amen. And that's how this ministry lives. So I'm glad you believe in this ministry and trust it enough to not only have me in your building, but to come out to the services. Don't forget the tapes on the table. There's a sign-up sheet. Uh, don't pay for them yet because we don't know what we're going to do yet. But if you, if you know, hey, I'm going to need those tapes, sign up. And uh, we'll let you know what's going to happen. You'll either get them Wednesday evening or over the weekend, uh, whatever we do. So, But get on the list because we need to know how many albums to order and all of that. And you'll have them the very last service. Uh, you can walk out the door with them. I think that's it. I've got so many battery packs on. My pants keep on. I'm going to have to tighten my belt. I'll be... Moving along here and lose my britches. Hey, amen. Don't look, Ethel. It was too late. She done been mooned. <laughs> amen. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, is where we're going to go again. We started something yesterday I, I can't let go of. And it's breaking a mindset. Most of the body of Christ, and I say this because of what I see and what I experience as I travel. Most of the born-again believers have a mindset of poverty. Amen. Poverty mentality is just enough to get by. Just enough to get their needs met. Poverty mentality is, well, I'll have more when I get to heaven. A poverty mentality is a mentality that looks inward instead of outward. The mindset of prosperity, prosperity-minded believers are ones who are kingdom addicted. That means they're just, they're just wanting to bless people. They're wanting to help people. They're wanting to show the world, you know what, I was sick, but now I'm healed. I'm not waiting on heaven. I believe now faith. Amen. And so we're breaking that mentality. Poverty is a mindset. It is not a condition. You change the mindset, you can change the condition. Amen? Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 6th verse says it this way. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. I'm going to find myself wanting to hesitate and wait for the translation. Amen? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently need. No, God doesn't meet needs because there's needs. Seek, to seek, to seek, to desire to be like. To seek means to desire to be like. That's a good definition rather than to beg. 
Amen. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. We know this now. That is, really could be translated this way and really clarify it. Without confidence, it is impossible to prosper. Father, I thank you in the house tonight. You're going to teach us how to prosper. You said you would set us as a city on a hill. No matter what we're going through, even if we go through the fire, we're not even supposed to smell like the smoke. Father, though the floods come, the floods don't get us. Though the rain pours, the rain doesn't get us. God, it doesn't matter what we go through. We're going to come out on top. God, that is the mindset of prosperity. So, Lord, you know what these people are going through. You know all the arguments the enemy has thrown against their lives and in their minds. And I thank you, Father, the angels right now are standing guard around the perimeter of their spirit property. Nothing but the voice of the Holy Spirit will, will be heard. I'll not just speak about you. I will speak directly for you. I summons all nine gifts of the Spirit to flow through me as the need demands it. And Father, I thank you tonight. There will be baptisms in the Holy Ghost. There will be mindsets that change. We are going to convert to think relational more so than dependent. And Lord, I thank you for that. And we declare it done. Somebody said amen. amen. You can be reseated if you will. I do want to move uh, very hurriedly, but I, I want you to get this. Without confidence, it is impossible to prosper. Say that with me. Without confidence, it is impossible to prosper. So if a born-again believer is not prospering, it's not because God hasn't shown up, and it's not because the devil's too big and bad. It's because there has been a lack of the renewing of the mind. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to poverty, diseases, death, curses, and lack, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and perfect perfect and acceptable will of God. I, I like to put it this way. If you can change your mind, you can change your life. I'm reminded of a story of a bear that was held in captivity over in Europe many, many years ago, a true story. And the owner of that bear, ever since it was a cub, kept it in a 12 by 12 chain link cage, similar to a, a dog cage. All of that bear's life, he took 12 steps forward and 12 steps back. He was incarcerated. That's all he knew. The owner of that bear tortured the bear. It would, it would poke him with jousting sticks through the chain, chain link. Uh, it would, it would uh, feed it cigarette butts and on different occasions would crush up glass and mix it in the food until as the bear digested it, it would just rip through his intestinal system. And, and, and it was so tormented and tortured the zoo at Heidelberg, Germany heard of the torture it was going through and purchased the bear from this particular individual individual. They moved the bear from that cage, from that surrounding to the zoo in Heidelberg. Beautiful landscaping. It, it, the bear could have anything it wanted in that. It was cared for. It was taken care of. The zookeepers tried to show it love and mercy. And they removed that chain link cage. And all that bear did was 12 steps forward and 12 steps back. What are you saying? You can change your surroundings, but until you change your mind, you'll always be what you've always been as long as you do what you've always done. That bear died never understanding what it was to take a 13th step in the same direction. And too many born-again believers are not enjoying the fruits of what Jesus paid for at Calvary because they haven't changed their mind. Twelve. Somebody say twelve. Twelve is the number of governmental authority. Twelve in Scripture has scriptural numeric value in that it, 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 it speaks of an establishment of a throne, a way of thinking. The number twelve speaks of an established way of thinking. The bear never changed his way of thinking. And many born-again believers have yet to change theirs. Therefore, they live and die with curses like everybody else. But God's will is that we prosper. Third John 2 through 4 says, My brethren, my beloved, I pray pray that you prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. We usually stop with that verse. But in the second through the or the third and the fourth verse, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. God is equating knowledge of truth with blessings, prosperity, and health. Let me put it in a Floridian translation. To the degree you know the truth of the word, it is to that equated degree that you are healed healthy, blessed, and prosperous. 
I'll say it again, John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if I don't know truth, I'm not free. So therefore the word says in all you're getting, get understanding. Why? Because understanding will liberate you to prosper. Why does God want his body to prosper? In the old covenant, the law of first mention, God wants us to prosper so that he can establish his covenant of goodness in the earth. God wants you wealthy. Hello? God wants us wealthy. Who wants us healthy? We can have our bumper stickers and T-shirts and all our WWJD bracelets, but let me tell you what a witness is. When everybody else in Florida is getting the flu and you just shicky mo shy pass me on by, baby, it just doesn't come nigh your dwelling. That was an old covenant pro a promise to a bunch of people that weren't filled with the Holy Ghost and didn't even know Jesus. And God said sickness and disease won't come nigh your dwelling. Why? Because they had faith in the Word of God. But now we have a much better covenant. They had, they had to work for the favor. Today, we just have to accept the favor. So our inability to accept the goodness of God is that very thing. Somebody say unbelief. Unbelief is the very thing that will keep someone from the goodness of God. Amen. Let me show you something in the book of 1 John, the fourth chapter. This is going to be so good. Even if I am preaching it, this is just, this will rock your world. Amen. You're going to the doctor tonight. Okay. The Holy Spirit's going to be your doctor. Now, you, you know, if you're sick and go to the doctor, you don't want to, him to look at you and say, well, you look all right to me. You want him to diagnose what's wrong with you and then fix it. Amen. In the same sense, many people want to go to church to hear what all they're doing right. And very few really want to hear, you know, what's the holdup? The reason we in human nature do not like to hear that maybe we could be lacking or slacking or deficient in our thinking concerning the mind of Christ is because then the responsibility is put upon us to prosper. That's the reason I, I do not prefer the King James translation of Hebrews 11.6. It does not relate what God was trying to portray in the whole chapter of Hebrews 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Makes it look like, well, if he's pleased, you'll be healed. I'm sorry, I thought God was pleased with Jesus. See, it makes no sense. It's a very poor translation of that scripture. What sounds better is without confidence, it's impossible to prosper because now the responsibility is upon me. The Bible doesn't say whatever God thinks in his heart, so are you. If that be the case, you'd all be healed. You'd all be delivered. So if God thinks that about us, Guess what? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Going to church faithfully, doing the things that God commands us to do faithfully is for one purpose, and that is to take on the mind of Christ. You need to do daily devotions. You need to pick up books that will encourage you and feed you for the purpose of taking on the mind of Christ. The question could be asked, do I have the mind of Christ? We're going to find out. First John, the fourth chapter, looking at just two verses, the 17th and 18th verse, love, somebody say love. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment. That's not necessarily speaking about when you stand before God. You've already been judged. You've already been judged in Christ. Righteousness. How many of you are righteous? Okay. Righteous is a declaration. That means if the judgment, your judgment is now righteousness. God doesn't play double jeopardy. You can't be retried for the same crime. When Jesus became a curse, he took everything that could ever come to your life or that was upon your life, and he became a curse so that you and I might receive the blessings and the promises of Abraham. So the day of judgment is not so much when you're standing before God. The day of judgment is any day on this earth when the enemy attacks you. He says, I want you to have boldness, but you're going to have to understand love. 
Let me keep going. Because as he is, so are we in this world. 18th verse, there is no fear. Somebody say fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. But he who fears, what's this, does not understand how much God loves them has not been made perfect in love. Mark, how can I be made perfect in love? Through understanding. Through understanding. I read those passages to bring this to you. There are true two primary, and in the secular world they would say emotions. In the spiritual world we say spirits. There are two primary emotions or spirits. Well, that person's angry. Well, anger is just a fruit of fear. Well, that person uh, uh, is, is a fornicator. That is a fruit of fear. Well, that person doesn't pay their tithe. It's a fruit of fear. Well, that person's not faithful to the vision of their leader. It's just a fruit of fear. It doesn't matter what fruit is producing. They have one of two roots, love or fear. It doesn't matter what has been, you know, I have people come to me, oh, Brother Mark, pray. I, I, my daughter, she was raised in church, and she's, she's gone off, and, 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 and she's a, a, a dancer now. Or pray for my son. He's dealing dope now. Pray for it. And they wonder, God, where did I go wrong? It's not so much they went wrong. The enemy came in the garden to sow a seed. What do you do in a garden? You sow seeds. Why did Satan come in the Garden of Eden to sow a seed? Who did he sow it in? The womb man or the mind of man? What seed did he plant in the woman? Rejection. People that operate in different fruits, it will always fall back to either rejection, insecurity is a fruit of rejection, nakedness, lewdness, fornication. These are all seeds of rejection. Somewhere in their life, that person was rejected. So we've been praying, God set them free from that. God's, and God's saying, you can cut that fruit off all you want to. But until you deal with the root, the fruit's going to keep growing right back in their life. So God said, I'm going to give my body the authority to lay the axe to the root. So there are two primary spirits or emotions in every living being. It is spirit of fear or spirit of love. Now, medical science and some of you may be aware of this. Medical science has adapted technology to measure the vibrations that the human body radiates. Every human being radiates vibrations. Have you ever heard, oh, when she walks in the room, the light, it just lights up the whole building. Or you, oh God, here he comes. You know, because that person radiates. Now, this was not a study done by, by Christian scientists. This was not a study done by spirit-filled believing scientists. This was done by the secular world, compiled of agnostics, atheistics. This was done by medical science because they were, were wondering why don't people live as long as they're supposed to? Why do many people visit the doctor sick so much? Why are many people not happy like they're supposed to? be. What is the difference between a person that lives longevity of life and a person whose life is cut short? What is the difference between a person that's seemingly healthy all of their days and other people that just struggle in sickness all of their life? And medical science wanted to know this, so they devised a technology which they would literally hook your body up to a to a device that would measure the vibrations you give off. If I, my understanding is right, the decibels it would give off was somewhere between 200 and 900. That was the scale they measured them on. They said people who gave off the lowest vibrations were people who lived sicker, visited the doctor more often, lived more in poverty, and died young. On the other end of the spectrum, those who operated in high vibes were people who visited the doctor less often. They usually lived in wealth and they lived longer. They said, secular science, said those who operate in low vibes 
were people who by poll and study tended to be those who feared every little thing. You're going to get this tonight. Born-again believers are supposed to operate in high vibes. People of the world who have no covenant with God and haven't received the blood of Jesus are the ones who are supposed to be living in fear. Therefore, Paul told the young, Tim, the, the young minister Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So what's this? Love and fear is of the mind because your spirit is holy. You either think fear or you think love. Which realm you operate in is the determining factor of what you end up with. If you are poverty minded, you operate in fear. If you are prosperity minded, you operate in love. Are you with me tonight? Somebody say good vibes. Now why is that so important what vibes I put off? Understand this, everything that God does has and has done, everything, including the only begotten Son, came in seed form. You remember in the garden, Genesis 3.15, when God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman's seed, and her seed shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Everything starts as a seed. Therefore, the Word declares we are the seed of Abraham. Amen. When the word says in Ephesians 1, 3, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, what he is saying is this. A seed is a spiritual blessing. A seed is in spiritual blessing form. Is healing a spiritual blessing? Come on, talk to me. Healing's deliverance is a spiritual blessing. Out of debt? You have every thing that pertains to life and godliness in you but it's in seed form this is why God can say dogmatically that I am not a respecter of person he gave every man the choice of life and death what you produce is up to the vibes you give off your talent your giftings your callings in you are still in you, but they're in seed form. It is up to you and it is up to me to produce that that will make that seed come into fruition. If I give Miss Diana and Janice and Brother Cody $75,000 a piece and I say, go buy you a Lexus. And here comes Brother Cody tomorrow night in a GMC. Well, I, I'm not against GMC, but it's not my will. But it's better than he had, so he's happy. Okay, I don't even know what he drives. This is just hypothetical. Then here comes Miss Janice. She comes driving in in, in a Ford. You, you have a... Now, I'm not knocking Ford. I drive a Ford myself. But that's still not my will. Oh, it's better than she had, but it's still not my will. But then here comes Mama Diana. She coming in in a Lexus. You get on down with your bad self. Yeah. You go, girl. And everybody, guess what? Everybody going to be flocking her car. Oh, God been good to you. Yes, he has. But let me remind you. I was just as good to the others, but you choose this day who you're going to serve. You are the one that determines what you get out of life. Now, most preachers will tell you how to live with what you've got out of life. I come to tell you, God is not a respecter of person. Over 7,000 promises, spiritual blessings, let's call them seeds. When you got Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everything that God is was in Christ and now Christ is in you. So every one of these promises are in every believer. What you end up with is determined by what vibes you put off. That means it's never too late to be healed. That means it's never too late to get your household saved. Household salvation is a seed in you. 
He said, I'll save your whole household. Well, God, I don't see it. You've got to produce it. And the reason I'm saying this, it's in seed form. Number one, it's scriptural. But number two, now I'm beginning to understand. Jesus referred to our minds as the soil or the ground in Matthew 13 in the law of the four sowers. Our minds is the ground. Your mind is the ground through which the seed is planted. Therefore, whatever a man thinks, that's what he is. See, you've got to get your thinking lined up with God's thinking to be what God is. Prosperity is believing all things are possible. You hear me tonight? Watch. I am not a person who knows a lot about farming and horticulture and all of these things agriculture and all of this but I do understand the germination of a seed when a seed is planted into the earth what causes that seed to break open is vibration that seed will literally begin to vibrate if the seed never vibrates it never opens you're gonna get this tonight see I keep on having that song come to my head I'm giving up good Amen. You're going to leave here tonight vibrating. You're going to get up in the morning vibrating. If they hooked you up, you'd go off the scale because God is instilling love in your heart, love in your mind, and you're going to produce what God has put in you. When God created you before time began, He put all good things in you. And the enemy's trying to make you think you've got to live without it. But I came here to tell you, He's still God. The Word is still true. It doesn't matter what you've been told by this person and that person. Let every man be a liar. But the seed of God will not return void. But it will do what it was put in you to do. Tell your neighbor, you're full of it. You are so full of the blessings of God, it's ridiculous. So Mark, do I put off low vibes or high vibes? Do I? Do, do I operate in love or do I operate in fear? Somebody say 12. Now remember 12 is a mindset. 12 is a mindset. Watch this. 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. 1 Kings 19. I would translate that into Spanish, but we have enough headphones tonight. I don't, yeah, you want to hear me speak? I don't speak Spanish. (laughs) That's the reason I'm messing with you. You'd start bowing your heads thinking I was talking in tongues. Amen. 1 Kings 19. Now, I'm going to skip a lot of this story that is relevant, but not to the point it can help the revelation. Elijah has just kicked tail and took names at Mount Carmel. I mean, fire from heaven fell. 450 prophets of Baal dead, swimming in their own blood. And prophet, and the prophet Elijah, he's pumped. But he gets an email from Jezebel that says, I'm going to kill you. And he runs, and he runs, and he ends up and spends the night in the cave. So this is where we pick up. God speaks to him while he's in the cave. The 15th verse. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. And you shall also anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi as king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola. You shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 19th verse. So Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plying with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was the 12th. Somebody say 12. Where I want to drive us home to tonight is I've always had this dilemma. If there were 12 people in the field, why was Elisha the only one to get it? If there's so many people in church that have needs, why don't all of them get them net? Why is it every now and then one or two get it instead of everybody? Watch. 
and he was the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. By the, word, the way, the word mantle in the Hebrew means an upper class, a place of supremacy. Are you ready to go to another level? You ready to catch a mantle? Amen. And he left the oxen and ran after him and, and, and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I'll follow you. And he said to him, Go back again for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh. Now don't get hungry. Amen. He boiled their flesh using the oxen's instrument and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Again, my question has always been this. Why Elisha? Well, I know it was God's will that Elisha have a double portion. Elisha was created with a double portion seed in him. You've been created with seeds in you, seeds of greatness. See, God says, I have thoughts of you, and they don't include evil, and they don't include harm. All of God's thoughts toward you and me are favor. All of God's thoughts toward us mean no disease, no lack, no poverty. All, God thinks nothing but good about us. You, you understand that? The last thing the enemy wants us to do is to begin to operate in the spirit of love because when we operate in love, faith works by love. Confidence works by love. And if you operate in confidence, you will naturally operate in prosperity. But Elisha was the twelfth man. Somebody say the twelfth. So in Old Covenant types and shadows, we are seeing God is drawing a picture of the mindset of the New Covenant believer. When he mentions the number 12, he's telling us this is the mindset you've got to have to catch the mantle. This is the force you've got to walk in to vibrate your destiny. Mark, do I operate in love or fear? I don't know. Elisha operated in love. He had a destiny of doing twice what Elijah did. Well, what do I need to do to start walking in love? Number one, you've got to know your name. Elisha knew his name. What, what do you mean? The word, the name Elisha in the Hebrew means salvation of God. This is the way you've got to start thinking and I've got to start thinking in order to produce our destiny. Even while I'm ministering tonight, you're going to start having seeds just jumping in you. Are you hearing me? I can tell you this emphatically. I can't remember the last time I had to ask God for anything. It just happens. I'll say it again. When you begin to vibrate to the degree that God has called you, He knows your need before you could even ask. It was just met. Why? Because it was in you to get through it, but you vibrated it before you ever had a chance to ask for it. That's where we ought to be living. You've got to know your name. What do you mean, Mark? You've got to take on the twelfth man's mentality that you know who you are. Who are you? You are the Elishas of God in 05. You are the Elishas of God. You are the salvation of God in the earth. You are the representative of God's saving grace. What are we doing walking around broke, busted, and disgusted? We need to know our name. I fly quite often and people say, Oh, aren't you afraid of all these terrorism? No, I'm not. 200 other people are safe because Elisha's on the plane. You understand that? I, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't care to live in fear. Oh, did that happen overnight? No, it didn't because I was raised in traditional Pentecost that injected you with fear. Oh, you better watch. You better watch the devil's out to kill you. You better watch. Oh, don't mess up and open the door to the devil. You'll die. And we just sat around and here, smoke some of that for me. Amen? And we just sat around and get stoned on death. And then we'd, we'd cap it all off and get drunk on, we'll understand it in the by and by. And we'd bury them every week. Now we're laughing because if you've been in church very long, you know what I'm talking about. And we thought we were right. We didn't know any better. And the first few years of this ministry, I did the same thing until the word stopped making sense. And I come to the point, I was in Oklahoma City in my room, and I said, God, why isn't this working? Your word's supposed to work and you're not a liar. So evidently it's not you doing something wrong, it's me thinking something wrong. And God said, let me teach you about me. Why don't you put away the Matthew Henry and the finest 
mistake in the King James and let me lead you through the scripture and I promise I'll guide you into all truth and you're going to know this truth and you'll be liberated. I said, do it. And one of the first things God began to show me is how to operate in the spirit of love by understanding my identity in Christ. I am the salvation of God. Oh, are you afraid about NASDAQ and Wall Street? Oh, my God. Just think if, if, if what's going to happen in the economy. It doesn't matter. The government of my peace is upon his shoulders. See, I just think that way. Oh, what about the flu? I, I just don't worry about the flu. We had Christians going around getting stupid I got a new, we should have got Carrie in there. We don't have enough flu shots. I knew it. I don't care that he kills babies. I just want a flu shot. What a goober. Translate that, baby. <laughs> Amen. What a stinking goob. See, we haven't thought like the salvation of God. You've got to walk on your job when, when your mind's telling you, oh, you're not going to get a raise. You're going to be here all your life at the same pay scale. All oh, Social Security's going to fix your income and they're about to run out. The enemy is always trying to induce fear because he knows any little bit of earthquake could cause that seed to break forth. So now you're getting yourself in an environment and you're listening to only stuff that will build you up on your most holy faith. And you look in the mirror of the morning and Instead of seeing wrinkles and aging and oh my God is bad. Oh God, thank you for time. Oh God, thank you for this. No, you get up in the morning and say, man, I can see myself as the glory of the Lord. We are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. When you walk on your job, matter of fact, you ought to go to your boss and tell him you're blessed because I work for you. You ought to see, you've got to see yourself as the salvation of God. You're not lucky, you're blessed. Luck runs out, but blessings are forevermore. You are the salvation of God. You ought to go to some rank family member you got and say, you know what, you're blessed, I'm in your house. You, you ought to tell them. You ought to just tell them, you know, the rude one. You ought to just tell him, you know what, you're, you're blessed, I'm in, I'm in your family. Well, what do you mean by that? Because you're not going to go to hell. Well, what if I want to? You couldn't if you wanted to. Well, I don't believe in God, you will. How can I do that, Mark? Because you have a seed in you that when it opens up, your whole household is saved. My God. It's in you already, but you've got to start seeing yourself as the salvation of God. You've got to start seeing yourself that way instead of running with every fearful thought that goes around. Hello? Watch this. The second thing, this is just the mindset of the 12th man, the new man, the new mindset that operates in prosperity. The second thing Elisha knew was he knew who his daddy was. Elijah told Elisha, I want you to anoint, or, or God told Elijah, I want you to anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Now, Shaphat in the Hebrew language means one whom he has judged. A person that has a prosperity mindset lives like they've already been judged. You are the offspring of one who has been judged. Look at John 12, 32. But let's just get educated a minute. There's been a, uh, we have so misconstrued the word of God, it, it's pathetic. Look at John 12, 32. You, most of you could quote it. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. But if you look at the word men, it's in italics. That means the word men is not put there by God, but by translators. Read the three previous verses. He's talking about the judgment is coming. Sin is coming. And he's going to be used to judge it. So therefore he says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth... What's he talking about? On the cross. 
He wasn't talking about the catching away. He was talking about when I am hung on the cross. Remember what he said? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a cross. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all judgment to myself. So you've got to start seeing yourself as redeemed. Stop living like, oh my God, my past is going to catch up with me. Let me help you out. Your past can't catch you and your future can't stop you. It doesn't matter how bad you've been, how many times you've lost in life, how many times you promised God and failed Him. When you got up on your feet and you said, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. It wasn't a guarantee you'll never make mistakes, but it was a guarantee that all judgment was upon Him. My God. We've got to stop living like, ooh, God's going to get you. Let me help you out in an Oklahoma, Texas slang. If God was out to get you, you would have done been had. God is not out to get you. He said, oh, I'm out to get you, but only to take over you with my blessings. God's out to bless you. You've already been judged in Christ and declared righteous. When you got saved. When you got saved. What, was, what is salvation? Acceptance of verdict. Salvation is when you have accepted the verdict. What is the verdict? He paid the price. He became the substitution. And now I've got to renew my mind to start living like, you know what? I don't fear my mistakes catching up with me. I see myself as the salvation of God in the earth and uh, the offspring of one whom he has judged. Are you getting anything out of this? Mark, do I operate in love? Do I give off high vibes? Do you see yourself as the salvation of God? Do you fear judgment? Because if you do, you operate in fear. You've got to start enjoying your salvation. This is the reason I hate damnable religion so bad. Religion induces fear. Most of the songs we used to sing in our traditional Pentecostal church, we thought we had so much, but most of them induced fear. Hello. Third thing you got to know. I've only got 25, so I'm moving quick. I'm just kidding. <laughs> What's this? We're, we're having to change our minds to operate in prosperity. Say this with me. Prosperity is a mindset. That's what it is. It's a mindset. So if I can change my mind, because see, I'm, I'm seeing this. There, there were many yoke of oxen in the same field. There's a lot of people in the same body of Christ, but not everybody's producing their God-given ability. And I want to know why. And I'm, I'm telling you tonight, it's because most of them operate in fear instead of love. Mark, do I operate in love? I don't know. Uh, do you reside in Abel Mahola? Somebody say Abel Mahola. The word says, I want you to anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola. This is the mindset you've got to have. You are a resident of Abel Mahola. Abel Mahola in the Hebrew language means meadows of dancing. Let me talk to these people a minute. Abel Mahola in the Hebrew language means meadows of dancing. Now, now what's this? If you truly vibrate, it's because also you are a praiser by nature. Praise is not what you do. Praise is what you are. You operate in the meadows of dancing. So you see, we don't dance because we always feel like it. We're dancing to vibrate our seeds. So therefore, right in the middle of praise and worship, and you're dancing before the Lord, that's when you say, oh my God, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. My back's healed. That herniated disc is no more. Cancers fall off in the meadows of dancing. There ought to be something different about this house. And it ought to be the thing that you know what? Every visitor ought to say, that's the dancingest bunch of people I ever seen in my life there's some of them that they don't actually dance in time but it's like they don't care they don't have all the funky moves but they don't care it's like them people even the grandmas and grandpas they just doing this thing wow thing 
Amen. You just you just doing whatever because you're understanding. I'm not dancing because I feel like it. Because if you only praise when you feel like it, you're not going to praise all the time. People who put off high vibes are ones who understand when the enemy's telling you you don't feel like praising God. When the enemy's giving you every reason not to pray God, praise God. That's the time you've got to break forth with singing and break forth with dancing because in the middle of the meadow is when God's going to start speaking life and manifestation into you. Right in the middle of you praising. Somebody say, hey, Bell. Mahola. Now you see why the enemy so tried to strip praise and especially the dance from the church. I just... I just want those old tunes that mama had. Here, I'll hold your sign, amen, while you die. Because that's exactly what's going to happen. Well, it, it was good for Paul and Silas. I beg to differ. They died a horrible death. Give me that old time religion. It was good for Paul and Silas. And they start naming off everybody that's dead. It was good for mom and daddy. Dead. It was good for Paul and Silas. Dead. Amen. Religion will kill you. Religion will tell you, oh no, you don't do that unless God moves you. But the person who operates in love says, you know what? Though a thousand may fall at my right and ten thousand at my left, yet will I praise him. Habakkuk said, the tornadoes came, the winds came, the family's gone, the kids gone, the house is blown away, but yet will I joy in the God of my salvation. You've got to get the praise back back in your life if you're going to manifest your healing manifest the seeds of God that's in you you've got to get your dance back I'm afraid I'll look goofy I'll tell you what's goofy plowing in the field and never catching a mantle that's goofy that's goofy what's this somebody say it's a car are you getting anything out of this? Yes. So we're finding out God to operate in fear or love. We're trying to learn how to operate in love. Then things just happen. They, they just happen. So say it again, please, Issachar. You've got to have the mindset you dwell in Issachar. See, he was a resident in Abel Mahola. But Abel Mahola was to Issachar what Daytona Beach is to Florida. It's a community in the region. Issachar in the Hebrew language means God will pay back. Hence, place of expectancy. Oh, it's it's going to get in you. I'm giving up good vibration. Amen. Well, why would I want to praise God? Because you dwell in expectancy. Let, let, me, let me just... Cut through the chase here. If you don't praise God, it's because you don't expect nothing. Instead of saying, oh, poor soul, look at her. It's just hard. It's hard for her to get into the service tonight. I just want to go back and lay hands on her. No, you ought to go back there and shake her tail out that seat and say, get up on your feet and start dancing a little bit. You don't feel sorry for them because, oh, look what they're going through. You feel sorry for them because, look at them, they don't expect anything. Oh, now you're going to have to get up and move, homie. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, now, now what's this? Well, Mark, you're being too hard. No, I'm, I'm being very serious. I'm being very serious. The enemy will steal away your destiny by hindering your praise and your expectancy. Expectation is the breeding ground of the miraculous. So if you don't expect anything is going to happen, you aren't going to do anything to make it happen. God has moved the cage off of you just like they did that bear in Heidelberg. But until you take a 13th step, 13 is the scriptural number of rebellion, until you rebel against the old, you will never walk in the new. Well, I've spent too many years out there dancing in the world. 
You got some good practice, baby. Just keep your clothes on. Amen? We don't have any poles in here or stages. But, but you know, you can still dance a godly dance. Don't be doing that wild thing or nothing like that. Amen? <laughs> Oh, surely you're joking. I don't have to. Uh, yeah, you do. David said his praise will continually be in my mouth. What's this? Somebody say the 12th man. Mark, do I operate in love or fear? I, I don't know. How quick do you respond when the Spirit speaks? Oh, dude. We should have quit on the dancing. Amen. <laughs> How quick do you respond when the Spirit moves? Because see, Elisha, once the mantle hit him, he left the oxen and followed Elijah. Isn't it amazing? How many of you have teenagers? How many have had teenagers? And you still found your way to the church tonight. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We, we have a 16-year-old and a 2-year-old, and I wonder sometimes. <laughs> I, I really do. But it's amazing. Derek, the oldest one, you, you can give him money and say, you know, go out with your friends, catch a movie, do whatever you want to do, have a good time. Okay, thanks, Dad. You can tell him, now, son, I want you to clean that room. I, I, I want you to dust I want you to go around the, the trim, the board. I, I want you to move stuff on the dresser and dust. Two weeks later, you walk in there. Why isn't this dusted? Oh, uh, I forgot. <laughs> isn't it amazing? Now, we're laughing, and teenagers, I don't mean it at your expense. We all did it too. But isn't it amazing? We don't need confirmation for something we want to do. But when God speaks to our heart, we need five letters from Paul and Jan at TBN. We need Benny to come tell us in person. And we need Joyce to give us an email. And it's all because the flesh doesn't want to do it. You know, the first I remember the first time God spoke to me to give a vehicle away. I was like, get behind me, Satan. My tada And I was casting because I thought it would surely God ain't going to tell me that. Because I was raised in a poverty mentality of he'll never ask you to give what you don't have. <laughs> you were there. But see, what's this? I've had people, well, God spoke to me five years ago about this. Well, aren't you tired of being at the same plow? See, there's some people in the body of Christ that were satisfied. Under somebody say the twelfth. Let, let me, I was going to skip this, but in lieu of time, but let me give this to you. It was so important to say the twelfth man. Why? Because it lets us know something about the mentality of Elisha. Elisha was a man who had a mindset. He was in charge of his destiny. You've got to take on that mindset. Because see, in that day, in that custom, we could be strangers just strolling through the meadows and, and the rolling hills and see a group of farmers plowing with oxen. If there were 15 yoke of oxen or 15 teams of oxen in the field, whoever was driving the 15th yoke owned the whole field. So when the word says there were 12 yoke of oxen and he was the 12th, it meant he had a mentality. If he was going to get it, if it was going to get done, it's because he was going to make it happen. That's the mentality you've got to have. And so when the Spirit speaks to your heart to do something, you can't delay. Well, how will I know it's God? Number one, because your flesh won't want to do it. Remember what he had to do with the flesh? He had to boil it. Hello? He had to boil it. God will speak to you to do th things. Do you realize every act of obedience? I didn't even see who come up here and dropped money in this offering for this ministry. But do you realize whoever did seed started jumping in you while you were walking up here? Why? Because you were denying the flesh. Slow obedience is disobedience. How can I know it's the voice of God? Your flesh won't want to do it. It will always build the kingdom and never cause division. 
that'll save you 25 bucks at the Bible bookstore, amen? And about 500 pages of reading. That'll help you out. We got a snorter, amen? Now, what's, what's this? Last thing. What's this? Mark, do I operate in love or fear? Now, I, I'm going to close. Mark, do I operate in love or fear? Do you see yourself as the salvation of God? Do you see yourself as free and righteous because you are the offspring of one whom he has judged? Do you see yourself as a resident in Abel Mahola? Do you see yourself as a person who lives in Issachar, the place of expectancy? Do you see yourself as the twelfth man, the one in charge of your destiny? Therefore, it's up to you. The power of life and death is in your tongue, not God's. It's now in yours. Do you see yourself that as a person that is slow or quick to react to the voice of God? Last thing. Mark, do I operate in high vibes or low vibes? Are you willing to sacrifice today what you depended on yesterday? The word says when Elisha got the mantle, he left the yoke of oxen, came back and boiled their flesh fed him to his friends. He gave away the very thing he depended on. People who operate in love are givers and self-deniers. People who operate in love are givers and self-deniers. Every now and then, God will ask you to do something that the flesh don't want to do. He may tell you not, I want you to get out there and just praise me a little bit. And the flesh is going to say, you're going to look absolutely ridiculous. Why does God ask us tough things to let us know who's in charge, love or fear? Because you produce the fruit you can tell me you love God, but the fruit on the tree tells all. And I believe you want to operate in love or you wouldn't be at church on a Monday night. How many is ready to start putting off good vibes? I want you to stand to your feet if you would, please. You've got seeds in you. Did Elisha ever produce the seed that was in him? Well, his seed was, I want a double portion. Do you remember that? When Elisha and Elijah crossed over the Jordan, and finally Elijah asked Elisha, he said, Man, what in the world do you want? He said, I want a double portion of that that you have. You remember that? Do you remember that? <laughs> I'm going to turn the pulpit around that way tomorrow night. Do you remember the response that Elijah gave Elisha? It always seemed a little goofy to me because I didn't understand it. Things you don't understand sound ridiculous. Elijah told him when he asked, I want a double portion. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I go, you have asked a hard thing. That word hard in the Hebrew language is a word they use in agriculture. It means to yoke a trained oxen to an untrained oxen until it's trained to lead. Mark, am I going to produce my destiny? I don't know. It's going to be a hard thing renewing your mind to operate in love. But if you want to lead people to Christ and let them see God has set you as a city on a hill in prosperity, you're going to have to hook yourself up to the Word of God and make yourself think God thoughts and cast down any thoughts that are not like God. Did Elisha get a double portion? Well, when Elijah died, they say he had seven major miracles to his credit. When Elisha died, he had 13, one short. But years later, after Elisha's death, they had buried his body in a cave. 
Years later, a war was going on. A soldier was wounded and died. His buddies carried him up to bury him. And when they laid his body in and touched the bones of Elisha, that man come back to life. God brought forth the seeds of destiny even when it looked like it was over. You may be sitting here tonight with health issues, marital issues, financial issues, domestic, biological, physiological, chemical issues in your life, addictions, but it doesn't matter how dead it looks. All you need to do is start vibrating again and that seed will produce what it was sent to do and will not return void. If you're here tonight and you haven't been operating in love and you've been operating in fear, I'm not preaching this to condemn you. I'm preaching it to show you. It's not always easy. It's not easy. So he said, I'm going to give you a helper, the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? He helps you to catch mantles. He helps you to want to praise. He helps you to want to give. He helps you to want to be obedient quickly. He's a helper. If you're here tonight and you've never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit as a helper, I'm going to encourage you to operate in that gift after this evening. Would you bow your heads, please? Father, if there is anyone under the sound of my voice, they've heard this message and they say, oh, I'd really like that, but I don't even have the seed in me. I don't even have the seed in me. I cannot say that I am born of the Spirit. If you are not born of the Spirit, you don't have these seeds in you. Well, I'm a happy person. Yeah, but you can't operate in love if you're not born again because God is love. How can you operate in something you don't have? You can't. But God is wide open tonight to say, come on, you believe in me. Why don't you accept me? Let me put a seed bag in you. Your life will just begin. Your life will just begin. I want to know very quickly, is there anyone here tonight? You say, Mark, I don't have the seed of Abraham. I don't have the Christ in me. I, I don't have that in me. And tonight, I need Jesus as my Lord. Would you show me your hand right now? Is there anyone? You need to raise your hand and say, Mark, that's me. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Very well. Would you look up at me? How many knows... It, it's easier said than done sometimes, being faithful. It's easier said than done, praising in the middle of a fire. <laughs> Amen. It's easier. I, I'm not, you know, crazy enough to tell you, oh, it's easy. It's not easy. It's a denial of the flesh. But in the middle of a battle is when you find out if a person has a prosperity or a poverty mindset. You don't want to miss this week, I promise you. It's going to change your life. You're good people, but we're going to catch another mantle. Are you ready for that? Here's what I want to ask, and here's, here's what the Lord has laid on my heart. I could see it. There were 12 different yoke of oxen in the field, but Elisha was driving the one that caught the mantle. You can live your life and go to heaven as long as you're in the right field, but aren't you tired of being at yoke two? Yoke number five? Yoke number seven, how you doing? Well, same old, same old. I'm here to challenge you. Let's go get the 12th yoke because it's the 12th yoke that catches the mantle. It's the 12th yoke. And if you're here tonight and you say, Mark, I didn't even know it, and I've been operating in some fear. I'm glad I'm born again. I'm glad I'm in the field. I'm in the body of Christ. But I've been at the second yoke. I've been at the third yoke. I've been born again for a little while. I've been born again for a long time. And Mark, I I've still got some destiny in me. I've got some healing in me. I've got some health in me. I've got some... Th How many has ever had a dream God was going to do something? Okay, a dream is a seed of potential, but you've got to vibrate it into destiny. This is where some false prophets have been tagged a false prophet. Well, if that's a word from the Lord, it'll happen. Well, that's not necessarily true. Because God's spoken into many people's lives and they still live and die without it. I have people come to me quite often and show me their little notebook. Look here, August 98, God spoke to me, said this was going to happen. September 99 God told me it was going to happen isn't God good October 01 God told me same thing 
I don't know. I think he's trying to tell you something. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hello. And then those poor saints, they die without it. Well, it must not have been a word of God. No, it was a seed that never got vibrated. It doesn't have to be a Christian that prophesies to you. It can be a clerk at Walmart. It can be a gas station attendant. If God can use a donkey, he can use an unbeliever. So it's not up to the person that gives the word. It's up to the one who receives the seed on good ground. If you're here tonight and you've been at any other yoke than 12, and you say, you know what? I don't care what people think about me. I'm coming to put my hand to the plow. I'm coming to put my hand and tell this congregation and tell this pastor and Pastor Chris and leadership that you know what? You can count on me to live in Abel Mahola. You can count on me to act like I live in Issachar. You can count on me to start thinking different and talking different and acting different. I'm telling you, church, it's not just something we scheduled. This was a divine appointment of God for this word this week for you your 05 is going to be totally different from your 04 because you're going to start I'm giving up good what are you doing at church on a Wednesday night you never show up I'm giving up good vibration amen I want anybody in this house, you're not ashamed to admit it. God, I've been at the wrong plow, and I'm going to put my hand to the plow and begin to renew my mind. I want you to come up here tonight. You may have issues in your life. You say, oh, I, I came to get a healing tonight. Vibrate your healing. Vibrate your healing.